With that being said, welcome everybody. I hope everybody is having a great Monday. Um, my name is Annie Mitchell and I'm a staff associate at Cal Zero Waste. And today is our last Zoom social for Cal Zero Waste and we are going to be discussing everything about compost. So before we get into this presentation, I would like to take the time to recognize that UC Berkeley sits on the territory of Huchin, the ancestral and unceded land of the Ohlone people. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona band. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institu institution's founding in 1868. As members of the Berkeley community, it is vitally important that we not only recognize the history of the land on which we stand, but also we recognize that the Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area communities today. And we must strive to be the best stewards of the land that we can be. Um, so I'm also going to be adding um, in the chat two links um, to the Segurite Land Trust, which is a woman-led land trust that facilitates the return of indigenous land to indigenous people. Um, on the website, you can calculate your Shumi land, Shumi land tax, which is based on your income and where you live. And then the funds are then used to calculate the rematriation of the land. So I just sent those in the chat if anybody is interested in checking those out. So before we get started, I just want to share a little bit about me. Um, I teach a course at Berkeley, which is a 101, everything you need to know about the planet crash course, covering everything from waste streams to food systems to decarbonization and the circular economy. I also run the Refreshing Refills program under Cal Zero Waste to encourage the UC Berkeley and broader community to refill and reuse. And then lastly, I'm also directing the ASUC Sustainability Commission, where we run a variety of different campaigns, including a restaurant sustainability rating system, an environmental justice and education project, and a speaker panel with a topic on environmental justice and intersectionality with BIPOC communities. All right, so here is our agenda for the Zoom social. So first I will give an overview of Cal Zero Waste, a little bit about what we're doing, and then we will jump into the presentation by answering the questions, what is compost and why compost? I will provide you all with the benefits of both industrial and at-home composting, as well as how to compost at home or in the dorms, especially when you have limited resources. And then we will end with a little bit of a group discussion um, and some time for questions. All right, so to jump into this, um, a little bit about Cal Zero Waste and who we are. So we are a campus department responsible for the Zero Waste by 2020 and Beyond goal, which I'm sure those of you who are familiar with campus know that goal. And we're also responsible for the facility services across campus. Our team consists of dedicated part-time student staff and full-time staff members who are part of operations on campus. They service the bins, and then we also have full-time truck drivers who um, service bins across campus. So in these photos here, you can kind of see an eclectic assortment of small bins without a lot of informative signage and a lack of consistency in the waste streams provided. So inefficiencies like these in our waste systems is a cost of labor, resources, and vehicles to collect and maintain. With COVID, we want to reduce the amount of contact, contact that our staff um, have on campus. So we are centralizing our bins to help protect our staff who are servicing the bins. Our approach to strategic zero waste planning and implementation includes a standardized set of bins, which includes cans and bottles recycling, composting, landfill, and paper and cardboard recycling across all of our campus buildings. For offices and dorm rooms, we are providing desk side bins like what you can see in that bottom left corner that have these large compost and recycling bins with small landfill bins attached because the majority of your waste is probably compost and recycling, not even landfill. We also are implementing large wheeled carts um, like the ones you can see on the bottom middle photo and large compost barrels for areas that collect a lot of waste on campus. And currently right now, Cal Zero Waste um, and some of our student staff members are currently rolling out the Zero Waste Building Program, which means that all four of the correct waste streams will be offered on, camp, comp, on campus. 
and that means that you can compost wherever you on wherever you are on campus. So before we jump into this presentation, um, I want to learn a little bit about you all. Um, so I'm going to put a Zoom pull up on the screen to gauge where you all stand on the topic of compost um, and what composting facilities are available to you in your area. I'm going to end the poll and share the results. So um, how familiar are you with composting is our first question. So that means how to compost at home, what do you put in the compost waste streams, etc. Um, so it looks like on a scale of one to five, five being the most, um, most people are at a four level of how to compost. So that's, that's quite impressive. I have a very knowledgeable crowd, it seems like. Um, and then the second question was, does your housing complex offer compost bins? So um, most people said yes, and one person said yeah, no. So um, we'll get into a little, get into that later, but if you live in Berkeley and your um, apartment complex has five or more units, your landlord is entitled um, actually to require a compost bin um, by city of Berkeley laws. So if you do live in Berkeley and you don't have um, com compost offered in your housing complex, we can get that sorted out. <laughs> All right, so to begin, I would like to get you all familiar with a brief statistic on waste. So actually over 50% of all municipal waste that is sent to landfill can actually be composted. When we break that number down, 21% of that food waste is food scraps, or of that waste is food scraps. 15% is paper or paperboard. 8% is yard trimmings, and another 8% is wood waste all of which can and should be composted. So you might be wondering, where does my banana peel or my other compost waste go when I throw it away? So I want to impart to you one key distinction. There is no such thing as a way because your waste will either end up in landfill or the environment. When co compostable materials are put in landfills, Methane is released, which is a greenhouse gas that is 36 times more potent than CO2. So it's actually really important that we throw our compost out in the appropriate waste stream. Compostable materials will also never break down in a landfill, meaning that a burrito that was thrown away 50 years ago still exists in a landfill today, getting piles of waste pressed on top of it. Furthermore, compost is a really valuable resource, which we will talk about later. So why do we take up this space in a landfill for a resource that can be regenerated and put back into the earth? So landfills are definitely not the solution to our compost waste. On the other hand, when we throw our waste away in incinerators, the resulting pollution is highly toxic and hazardous to humans, and it contaminates air, soil, and water, which is a really big environmental justice issue. So incinerating waste is again, not the solution. But in order to better understand what to do with our compost waste, let's first dive into what compost actually is. So it is organic material that is broken down into nutrient rich matter for soil. This aerobic decomposition process is what transforms your raw materials like your food scraps or your yard trimmings or your leaves into valuable soil conditioner. So why compost? Well, I've already mentioned one reason why we should compost, and that's that composting materials produce methane when they're put in landfills. But industrial composting comes with a multitude of other benefits. It can filter out urban stormwater pollutants by 60 to 95%, which can help protect groundwater supplies and communities, it protects against soil erosion, and increases soil fertility and microbial activity, it improves water retention and soil structure and prevents methane production. Furthermore, when organic matter is diverted from landfills and actually worked into the soil, it sequesters carbon. So there's actually a statistic from um, University of California, Berkeley, I believe, or UCLA or something like that. Um, and they found that if we applied less than one inch of compost to just 5% of California's rangelands, we would remove the equivalent of 6 million cars emissions from our atmosphere. So clearly compost plays a really important role in curbing climate change when done on the industrial level. 
compost is also not only beneficial from an environmental standpoint, um, it's also an essential economic alternative to landfills and incinerators. So making compost employs two times more workers than landfills and four times more than incinerators. Green infrastructure in city planning uses compost in rain gardens, green roofs, vegetated retaining walls, and on steep highway embankments to control soil erosion and stormwater, all of which create even more jobs. So composting is really important from an economic standpoint, and it's a transition that we really need to start making on a larger scale. So although I've mentioned so many benefits of composting, I implore you to consider the hierarchy of the five R's in your day-to-day -day life. So the first is re refuse. So picture this, we are living in a post COVID-19 world, school is back in session and clubs are scattered across the aisle. As you're walking to class, someone offers you a freebie. Oh, it's a reusable water bottle. But no, you already have a few of those, those at home, so refuse. Let's be honest, you really don't need them. The next R is reduce. Reduce your food waste. Unless you have a huge household, your fridge probably should not be full to the brim. And you're probably not eating all of that food before it goes bad. Next, reuse. When I finish a peanut butter jar, for example, I always keep the container knowing it will be useful at something for some point. And then the next R is rot or compost, which we all know the benefits of, but I'll get more into later, so I won't give a big spiel about it now. And the last R is recycle. So recycling means sending your cans, bottles, and any paper recycling to the right bins. But you also need to be careful about contamination. So try to clean your cans and bottles before throwing them away. However, I would like to point out that recycling has essentially stopped happening in the US ever since China stopped accepting our recyclable materials. We do not have the infrastructure here to support our recycling, but it is an environmental justice to send it um, injustice to send it to developing countries where it will likely get incinerated or not disposed of correctly and harm other communities. So recycling is not a climate solution and you should try to reduce the recyclable items that you consume whenever possible, which incorporates the other five R's. I also want to remind you that the five R's are in a hierarchy of importance. And while composting is obviously an amazing thing to do, do your best to first refuse and reduce whenever possible. Um, so before we get into our next section about at-home composting um, and small-scale composting, um, I just want to have a check-in point and offer um, some space for you all to ask questions um, if you have any about industrial composting or anything I've talked about thus far. I have a question. Um, if 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 I live like in a housing complex with a fewer than five units, um, is there still a way to get a large compost bin? Like if there are only two or three units, I believe you can reach out to your landlord, who can who has the ability to talk to the city about giving you composting facilities or composting bins. Um, so I believe you shouldn't have any issue with that if you just ask your landlord that it's something that matters to you. But by law, if you have five or more units, your landlord has to give you um, a composting bin. So I would just ask your landlord to reach out to the city about providing you with one. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any more questions? All right, awesome. I think I'm going to move on to the next slide. But stop me at any point if you have questions or you can also ask them in the chat. So now that we've discussed a little bit more about the importance of industrial composting, as well as why it is essential that you throw your compost waste out in the proper waste streams whenever possible, let's dive into the benefits of composting at home. So if you have access to outdoor space or any gardening space, your household compost is the single most important supplement that you can give your garden. It adds rich nutrients to your lawn and your garden to help restore and protect the soil, which in turn fuels plant growth and restores vitality to depleted soil. If you have healthy soil, 
you will grow nutritious and healthy food. Lastly, composting your leftover food or yard waste is a great way to practice regenerative methods of giving back to the earth and enhancing your surrounding environment. However, composting can really just be as simple as throwing it in the compost waste bin on your curb. It doesn't mean that you have to have a garden or you have to be growing your own food. Every single difference, every single contribution um, to helping compost really does make a difference. But with all that being said, it's important to know actually what to compost at home. So for starters, and probably the most obvious answer, you should always be composting your food scraps, including tea leaves, eggshells, and coffee ground. Guard waste like leaves and grass clippings, uh, flowers, and weeds are also compostable. But as a little asterisk on that weeds, um, be careful because some weeds are invasive species. So when you sprout them, when you put your compost down, the weeds could sprout wherever you put your compost down, which could hurt your garden or your lawn. Other things that you can compost are shredded paper and pizza boxes. Um, so basically really anything that is food soiled is compostable with a few exceptions, which I will get into. But I like to use the tear, tear test on products that I'm unfamiliar with, which means that basically anything that you can easily tear like a compostable cup or a napkin is compostable because this means that it is likely not lined in plastic. So now onto the few exceptions for what you can't compost at home. So any animal product like meat, fish, and bones are not compostable along with butter, cooking oil, grease, and animal fat. Um, so this is just like problematic for composting at home because it can bring in unwanted pests like rats and stuff like that. Um, if you are vermicomposting specifically, which I will get into later, it's worm composting essentially. Um, do not compost your citrus fruit peels as the acidity in the peels can actually throw off the pH of your compost bin and kill your hardworking worms. So don't make that mistake. Um, when you are done with fruits and vegetables, be sure to take off the sticker on the peel of them or on the outside of them because unless otherwise stated on the sticker, the stickers are not going to be compostable. Um, coated cardboard packaging, glossy paper and bioplastics are also not compostable at home. Whenever you're out and about, you should throw your bioplastics in the compost whenever possible. Um, so whenever you're on campus, if, you're, um, if you have those bioplastic utensils, you should throw them out in the compost. But in some cities, bioplastics are not accepted at industrial composting facilities. So be sure to do research about what city you're in. Um, know that in Berkeley, it's okay to compost them, but rules change from city to city. Coal ash from grilling, for those of you that are into grilling, also isn't compostable, and neither are dog and cat feces or litter. Um, and on that note, keep all human and animal waste out of the compost unless it's chicken manure, which is actually compostable, um, and I believe a good nitrogen source for um, compost. So, I said a lot about what to compost and what not to compost. I don't want to overwhelm you. Um, in fact, I just want to emphasize that every action and everything that you do matters. It certainly is really hard to remember all the rules about composting, but I encourage you to do what you can within your own means and your accessibility. So now that we know what and what not to compost at home, let's learn how. So your first step, if you are making your own compost, is to lay your compost pile on bare earth. Then you lay twigs and straw a few inches deep. You add your compostable materials in layers and then add manure or any other nitrogen source. Nitrogen sources can be any kitchen scraps or manure if you, if you happen to have any, for example. Keep your compost moist by watering it occasionally and then cover it with anything you have. And then you have to turn your compost every few weeks to break down the materials because what's going on inside that compost material is that the stuff in the middle is getting warmer and warmer and breaking it down more. So you have to keep turning it so that stuff gets in the middle, gets warmer and breaks down. So it's important that you choose the correct composting method depending on three key factors, where you live, what you'll be composting and whether you want to turn your compost manually or not. If you're willing to turn your compost every one to two weeks, 
enclosed bins or open compost piles could work for you. If you live in an urban environment and don't want to turn your own compost manually, compost tumblers or vermicomposting, again, worm composters are good. So um, this here, I've said a lot of words about these composts. Um, so this are, these are photos of the different options that you have. Um, so as I mentioned, compost tumblers are good if you are in an urban space and don't want to uh, manually turn it. Vermicomposting, same thing. Um, so as you can see in that bin there, you can literally just take any bin that you want, really DIY it, put worms and your compost together um, and the worms will do the work. And then there's the enclosed bin, which again, you can really easily DIY that. I saw an image on Google Images of someone just taking one of their like normal barrel trash cans and they put it in the enclosed bin, um, which actually worked really well for them because when they put the lid on, they could just roll the trash can around on the ground in order to turn it manually. So I thought that was pretty cool to do a little DIY version of an enclosed bin. And then there's also open compost piles. So for those of you living in urban areas with no outdoor space, but you are composting mostly kitchen scraps, a worm bin is best for you. If you live in an urban area with some outdoor space, a patio or a balcony, worm bins and compost tumblers are great options if you are composting mostly kitchen scraps and some yard waste. And then for those of you in suburban homes with a yard, enclosed bins or compost tumblers. These are best for composting food waste and yard waste, while a DIY bin is great if your compost is majority yard waste. Lastly, for those of you who live, possibly live in rural areas, which I'm not sure if that applies to anybody here in this audience, but enclosed bins or tumblers are perfect for food waste. Or if your compost is majority yard waste, multiple enclosed bins or an open compost pile does the trick. So I think this is a, a cool thing. UC Berkeley has vermicomposting at the residence hall Clark Kerm, where they donate some of the food waste from the dining halls to feed the worms. So I think that's super cool. And then there's also vermicomposting at um, SOGA, which is student garden off campus. Um, I believe the vermicomposting is not currently happening, but um, when they get worms again, they will be vermicomposting there, which is super cool um, because they're using the food waste from their garden to feed the worms. And then as a reminder, if none of these composting options suit you, you can always just throw your compost into a compost bin where it will eventually get driven off to an industrial composting facility. Um, and that will be used for a multitude of other benefits later on. Um, I understand that not everyone has the means to compost at home, but know that you are making a really big difference when you simply throw that banana peel out in the right bin. And then, as I mentioned earlier, there's also a law in the city of Berkeley that requires all residential properties of five or more units to provide recycling and organics collection for all of their tenants, food scraps, food soil papers, and any plant debris generated at the property. So if your landlord is not following this ordinance, you can reach out to the city to get that sorted out. And depending on where you live, some cities even offer composting workshops to help you get started with composting at home. Um, so definitely look into this if you're interested. Um, I'm not sure if Berkeley does that, but maybe for those of you living at home, um, this might be a helpful resource. So for those of you living in the dorms, you probably don't have access to outdoor space to compost yourself, but I do know that all of you have compost bins in your room. So you're not gonna get off that easy, you still have to compost. Um, so you should be composting your napkins, your paper, coffee grounds, tea bags, food scraps, and any PLA number seven foodware items. So um, if you're unsure about, you know, a plastic cup that you might be holding in your hand, look at the bottom of it and there's going to be a triangle on it that has a number on it. If you see PLA number seven, that means that it is um, certified compostable, and you can send those to um, the industrial composting facility if you are in Berkeley. Um, so unlike composting at home, if you're actually using that compost for your own soil, um, it is actually okay on campus to compost your meat bones and your food cooked 
heavily in oil because it all goes to an industrial composting facility, which has the resources and the infrastructure to break that down. Um, and now that all of the food from the dining halls is provided in to-go containers because of COVID-19, um, we just ask that you please read the labels and correctly compost or recycle your waste because everything distributed to you at the dining hall should either be compostable or recyclable. Um, however, don't compost your recyclables or non-biodegradable waste. So just make sure you're throwing out the proper things in the proper waste streams and taking extra caution to make sure you're doing the right thing. And then for those of you who might be working in the office, um, compost bins are provided in kitchens and larger bins are provided in centralized, centralized locations on almost every office floor if you're working on campus. So you should be composting your lunch, snacks, and any other food waste that you might be generating in the office um, into these compost bins. And then um, if you're at an event or someone offers again a PLA number seven option or offers a compostable products or bioplastics, just make sure you're reading the label correctly. Um, but usually things have, if they're compostable, they have like a green strip on it. So it's pretty easy to indicate um, whether or not it's compostable. And also, as I mentioned earlier, you can do the tear test whenever you're unsure if something can be composted, because again, if it tears, it's probably not lined in plastic. All right, so now for some discussion questions. Um, so we don't have enough people here to do breakout rooms. So I think we'll just do um, a discussion with all of us here. So um, this is kind of like a little review from the presentation, see if you guys learned anything. But my first question is how does compost enhance soil? So anybody can just unmute and start talking. Um, so compost, provides nutrients for the soil and that can help like your plants grow. Awesome, thank you. All right, our next question is, why is composting on a large scale um, level a climate solution? So again, another review question. So landfills contribute to climate change because they emit greenhouse gases. And so by like putting the waste that is releasing these greenhouse gases, specifically methane, um, it like it takes that out of what normally would be going into the atmosphere. And then um, and then it also like since it enhances soil health and like, plant growth, that can also be like another form of mitigating climate change because um, like plants are important like carbon sinks. Awesome, thank you so much, Lucy. That like nailed it to a T. Does anybody else have anything to add? Joseph, are you trying to talk? <laughs> I can't hear you. <laughs> but if you type anything in the chat, I can talk out loud for people as well. Um, cool, so my next question is, what changes are you going to start making? Oops, what changes are you going to start making at home? Um, so I can start with this question. Um, I personally want to maybe look into getting a vermicomposting bin at home because I live in an apartment complex in Berkeley um, and me and my roommate do um, compost every all of our food scraps and whatnot. Um, but it would be cool to not just send it to an industrial composting facility where I don't know what happens with it if it's actually vermicompost. That'd be super cool. Yeah, adding on to that, um, I'm a big like advocate for community composting efforts. So while it's great that um, California has the infrastructure to um, compost on a more industrial um, scale, it's also like very empowering um, for people like in a local space, like in an urban environment to learn how to um, recycle food scraps um, you know, with a closed loop system, like because on an industrial level, like it still has to be hauled quite far away. So if we do things like vermicomposting or like we work with a community firm like Soga um, to like bring our food scraps there, that's I think an even more sustainable solution to um, the large scale, yeah, climate crisis that, you know, managing our waste improperly poses. 
That's a great point, Jenna. Thank you for adding that. Um, yeah, exactly like what you're saying where industrial composting facilities are obviously great and I'm really grateful to have these resources available to us in the Bay Area. However, um, yeah, there are large trucks that are transporting um, composting to, over to the facilities, which is, you know, has a load of other, you know, environmental impacts that it's important to discuss um, and important to know about. Um, so, yeah, community led and community based composting and environmental efforts are really impactful. Um, and it was really cool. I went to the student garden yesterday actually and saw the composting going on there um, and saw a lot of community members gardening. Um, and it's really cool to see that that's happening in our own backyard, but that can be something that's implemented everywhere. You know, it doesn't have to just be in Berkeley. So Joseph in the chat um, is answering um, about why we compost. Um, so Joseph said it's also good to for retaining a lot of the moisture in the soil and it supports growth in the, whoa, big word, rhizosphere, which is primarily where plants are able to get their nitrogen fixed by fungi and other symbiotes. Wow, a little science science major over here, seems like. Um, thank you for adding that. I, I don't know all of the like science behind composting, but um, yes, in the most basic sense, yes. <laughs> Sounds great. Um, all right. Does anybody else have anything to add to question number three? All right, so moving on to question number four. Um, what are some of the challenges that some of you face at home or at the office regarding composting? I used to have a lot of issues with the like the little flies um but i found that like now that it's colder they don't show up anymore but um when they did putting the compost that you collect throughout the day in like a jar or something that would close helped a lot thank you for sharing jasmine yeah um i've been trying to do research on um what what you, you can do to get those fruit flies away and i'm not sure the best um solution, but I do know that apple cider vinegar, I believe is helpful to get rid of fruit flies. Um, maybe not on a large scale level, but if you have a small compost bin um, or you're manually composting at home, you might be able to um, ward off fruit flies with that method. But that's interesting about the temperature. I didn't know that when it gets colder, they, they flee. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Joseph mentioned in the chat, um, there's not a lot of room in my apartment for compost. And when I do try and make a bin in the rotting, the rotting causes a bad smell, which annoys my housemates. So yeah, that's super valid. Um, me and my roommate are composting at home. And what we do is um, put, we have our trash can, like most people have their trash can into the sink, but we put our compost under the sink. So that kind of helps with the issue of fruit flies and smell and stuff. And then we take it out pretty regularly. So maybe um, once every two or three days. Um, and I also know of some really nice, you can get like ceramic or metal composters uh, or compost like collecting bins. Um, and those kind of also help ward off smell because they're like in thicker containers. Um, Jenna said, I'm surprised that Sabina's landlord doesn't have a composting system set up in the city. I am too, Sabina, you gotta get on your landlord for that one. I actually just texted him during this and he said he can ask and try to get us a bin. So hopefully, oh, awesome. hopefully it works. That's great news. Keep us updated on that. <laughs> um, Jenna asked, Joseph, have you tried the Bokashi system? Apparently there is a little small with that. Um, I don't, Jenna, do you mind unmuting and explaining what that is? I um, honestly don't know much of the science, um, but I think it's like some type of fermentation process going on. Um, and yeah, it looks like Joseph Googled it. Um, and as he said, it is a small system that you can keep like in your kitchen. Um, and I don't think, I can't remember what, like if you can put meat scraps in there but I remember being surprised by like how you can what you can add to that 
compared to like vermicomposting because with vermicomposting you're only supposed to add like food scraps and then like bedding you know so you can add like newspaper and like um other carbon rich material like that but yeah I definitely think Bokashi is a good alternative I just haven't um for my research I just haven't done it myself Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jenna, for providing that resource. I actually have not heard of that. So that's going to be a um, cool thing to look into. Maybe I can implement that in my apartment. Um, so I'll wait for Joseph to type their message and then um, we can get on to the last question. I used to live um, last year, I used to live in a house with 13 people. Um, and we, that house accumulated a lot of trash. And i campaign really hard to get composting in our house um, just to get people to throw out their food scraps because we generate a lot of waste and a good majority of that was from the kitchen. Um, and my main challenge was just the fact that like nobody cared, nobody like understood the benefits of composting, nobody understood why it was harmful to send it to a landfill. Um, and so once everybody left during quarantine, it was only like five of us in the house. And so I was able to finally get the composting bin started in our house and people actually used it. But um, that was my big problem, which is the fact that like, there's so many people who don't care and don't know. It's really hard to like communicate with those people about why, you know, we should go through the extra step. Even if it's inconvenient to have to like, think about where you're throwing your waste out, why it's important to do that. Um, so, Joseph said it's airtight, so it decomposes anaerobically, which makes acidic soil, which is good for certain plants that like lower pH. Ooh, that's super interesting. Um, thank you for sharing that. And Sabina asked, does Soga take household food scraps? I live pretty close, so I'm wondering if I can just drop scraps off. And Jenna, thank you for answering. Um, the answer is yes, Soga will take household food scraps. Um, just no raw meat. Yeah, thank you, Jenna. Uh, they don't want like um, things like dairy and animal products and stuff like that will, will end meat um, can increase the risk of pests like rats. So um, just no meat. And then my last question, um, if it's all right. Oh, there's one more message in the chat. Oh yeah, no dairy too. Okay, um, so my last question is, what additional information um, about composting would be helpful for you? So if I didn't cover anything in this presentation um, or you have any more questions, let me know. And I'm happy to send out an email following this um, presentation um, with any additional information and resources. So um, feel free to unmute or type in the chat if there's any additional information that might be helpful for you because I like already learned something from a lot of a lot of the participants here about composting during this discussion time. So I know that there's always learning to be had. Um, yeah. All right, I think I'm gonna move on. So thank you all so, so, so much for attending. I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate that fruitful discussion. Um, if anybody have any, has any questions, feel free to stick around um, and ask. I'm happy to stay here until two o'clock. Um, but you can also email me at ann.marie at berkeley.edu with any questions, or you can visit the zerowaste.berkeley.edu site, which is Cal Zero Waste official website. And then while you're at it, you can follow us on Facebook or Instagram at Cal Zero Waste. Thank you so, so, so much for attending. Have a great Monday. Thank you, Annie. Thank you. Thanks, Annie. Of course. Thank you all.